Welcome to Breaking into Hollywood, the Master Course Live. Back with you again on a Tuesday night with another fabulous guest, probably the busiest woman in indie film right now. We were just talking about all the things that she's doing. <laughs> A couple of housekeeping things before I hand you over to Gary W. Goldstein. Um, if you have any questions throughout the show for Gary or for Suzanne, please just put them in the comments. We're keeping track of them. We can see them. We can bring them in if we have time. We'll get to as many as we possibly can. And um, if you are taking the master course at the moment, we are starting next week the uh, private sessions with Gary so that you guys can talk about the course, figure out what you want to do, what your goals are, ask any questions you have. So we'll be contacting you by email in the next few days to set those up for next week. So Mr. Gary W. Goldstein, why don't you take it from here? I would be delighted. Thank you, Bethan. Um, so uh, this, is, this is great fun for me because we have tonight with us Suzanne Lyons. Hi, Suzanne. Hi, Gary. <laughs> who I've known, I don't know how, I'm very uh, terrible with time, uh, so I'm going to measure it this way. I've known Suzanne a really long time. Um, <laughs> a long time. <laughs> yeah, a really long time. Um, so Suzanne, um, actually I'm not going to start with your bio because it goes back further. Suzanne has a really diverse background. She's probably one of the most, in terms of just your foundation and the diversity of expertise she brings to the game of producing, it started long before that. She was the head of, like, VP of marketing for a Canadian TV network and, as such, also produced a lot of series and a lot of news programming, a lot of diverse types of programming. So she was a hands-on producer starting from day one many years ago. Um, well, she's only 12, so not that many years ago. <laughs> uh, she, she, she also uh, uh, then, then found herself in, in beautiful Philadelphia yeah. um, and was in the area of international sales and distribution for both film and television. So that's a very critical, interesting piece for the brain to understand, yeah. like, how does this product find its way out into the world uh, in, 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 in both across film and television? She then um, uh, actually founded, I guess I would say, Flash Forward Institute, which is still in existence today. It is probably the single best store. Suzanne is renowned uh, for this incredible facility, knowledge, wisdom, strategy, tactics, everything around indie filmmaking. When I say independent film production, I mean like she has Bibles, she has systems and notebooks and Bibles. She teaches this to people and literally can take the unanointed and step them through how to actually raise the money, what's the conversation with the investor, what are the materials you need to put together, all the way through the release and the marketing. Everything from conception forward. And she has broken this down in a way that's just absolutely remarkable to me. Then in 1999, so now we're talking about 15 years ago, she uh, founded uh, with her partner uh, the uh, company she still has today which is Snowfall Films. Snowfall Films, um, I think we're going on about a dozen films now that they have financed, yeah. uh, that they have produced. Mm -hmm. uh, but again, in her, you know, there are a lot of people in Hollywood when you say they produced this film, well, they did, um, in a sense. When I say Suzanne produced a film, she, like, literally, she created the topsoil, she dug the hole, planted yeah. the seed, watered it. Like, I mean, she literally raised most of these films we're going to talk about. She grew from the ground up and was 100% responsible for them. So some of those films uh, were undertaking Betty, one of her first, really sort of a groundbreaking uh, film, uh, won a BAFTA award, the British Oscars, basically, British Academy of Film and Television. Um, won a British um, uh, Academy Award basically for 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 that. That was with Chris Chris Walken, Christopher Walken, and uh, Brenda Blethyn and Alfred Molina and Naomi Watts. I mean, you know, a first film with that cast. That's absurd. Okay. Well, we didn't plan it exactly that way, Gary. <laughs> we, 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 Suzanne, you know better than I. We oh, never boy. planned it exactly that way. It's just not the way films work. No, no. Um, yeah. Jericho, Jer I'm going to run through these. Jericho Mansions okay. with James Caen, jean Bia Bujol that Miramax distributed. It was an official selection at the Montreal Film Festival. Her films get a lot of notice, a lot of attention. Bailey's Billions, a comedy with Dean Cain, Tim Curry, John Lovitz. I'm going to, I'm going to stop there because I'm going to talk about some of these films in a moment. Okay. Um, uh, and uh, what I will tell you is I, we're eternally grateful. Actually, before I do that, uh, the mission statement on her website, be, this is great, being on the cutting edge of entertainment, 
creating projects that make an emotional, psychological, or social impact, generating vast revenues, and of course, having fun. And I believe she's done a lot in each of those categories. Um, she's been featured across a bunch of different, five different books. I'm not going to tell you about all of them. She's written her own book, uh, Indie Film Producing the Craft of Low Budget Filmmaking, which was published just this last spring um, and by a great publisher, Focus. And then you can always find that retail shops, Amazon. Uh, it's all over the place. It's, it's a fabulous book. Suzanne, <clears throat> um, no slacker, this woman, um, has one film coming out this coming Friday evening, or Friday, uh, mm -hmm. called The Calling. The Calling, um, she uh, executive produced with Christine Vachon, who a lot of you may not know the name, many of you do, but Christine uh, was sort of popped onto the scene with, she did a lot of stuff with Miramax back in the day, and her one of her big first films was Boys Don't Cry, an amazing Amazing film. So she's producing with Christine. Sony's well, distributing. Yeah, I was, yeah, I was the I was just the co-exec on that one. And uh, okay, Janice, well, a wonderful um, producer from Toronto was involved, and of course, friends of mine uh, here, Scott and uh, and Lonnie, two of the incredible producers from Los Angeles, originally from Canada, uh, and uh, and Scott actually wrote. Uh, the project, and then Jason Stone, another good friend of ours from here, but originally Canada, he was the right. director. So it the kind director. of was a real big team effort that you know that took a, a few years. To all, all every, every, every film, every film, Suzanne, as we know, takes a village. Yeah. Um, and so thank you for acknowledging all those wonderful folks. But I'm selfishly going to shine a light on you. Um, anyway, but it's true. These <laughs> these are all very very amazing folks that she's talking about. Um, and this film is with an amazing cast as well. Susan Sarandon, Ellen yeah. Burstyn, Donald Sutherland, Topher Grace. Um, so I'm excited to see it. Uh, now that film's coming out the end of this week. Yeah. And she's, and she's in pre-production on a film, the title of which I will or won't mention. It's up to you. But it's going to shoot in L.A. starting in September. The end of, yeah, the end uh, of September, early October. I'm very excited. We're working with Mar Vista on that right now, actually. Fantastic. Oh, very exciting. Uh, it, what, what what type of film is that? Is that a thriller? It's a thriller, and yeah, as much as I love the romantic comedies and, and the and the you know with the family films, I'm looking at my posters here, um, you know, and all the other things. I really love thrillers because that's the kind of movie I like to go see. Or thriller. Yeah, I, I and, agree. Uh, yeah, love it. Love it. So the, so this film starting uh, next uh, uh, well September this coming month, which it almost is, uh, and that's going to be shooting here in LA, and you're producing that, and then you're also not producing, but executive producing, and you're also getting readying this film that's going to shoot starting in October, the next month, in Nova Scotia. That's right, the end of October, I'm going up to Nova Scotia. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and so you're just a little bit busy. Um, <laughs> just well, a little today, bit. This so, week is busy because this is the week we're doing contracts and putting out the information and breakdown services for the actors and starting the casting process. That's the exciting part. I love that part. I mean, I love the development of it. You know, and obviously that's that's yeah. done for the most part. But now we're kind of jumping into all the the intense stuff and getting into the casting and working with Marvista is just such a joy and such a treat. I can't even tell you. I just love the love the people over there and have for a year. You know, and I've known them for about a little over a year now. So to be finally working with them on this and you know, it's just it's just so much fun. And my partner on this one here, uh, since Kate, you mentioned um, with Snowfall Films, I had a partner for a long time. Uh, and Kate, that was Kate Robbins, and she has gone back to her writing. So she's not uh, working with Snowfall Films anymore. Okay. The one I'm doing now is Mike Carthy, and he's my partner. So it's now kind of a variety of partners depending on the project and, and you know, where we are and what country and that sort of thing. Too. Fabulous. So, Suzanne, and, and by the way, you got to know that Suzanne, in my book, wins the award for probably the nicest person in Hollywood. Uh, <laughs> and, um, uh, but here's, so Suzanne, here's something I just noticed. I told you I noticed something. I didn't get to tell you what it was. Mm -hmm. As I was looking, and, and I know most of your films, but as I decided to go back and take a little peeky poo, uh -huh. and I noticed something actually quite fascinating. If I look at, let's start with Undertaking Betty, one of your early big successes. Yeah. One of, win, wins a British Oscar, basically. Um, so that was part of your debut, your breakout. It was with this all-star cast. Yeah. Uh, actually, the uh, the gentleman who wrote it, uh, his name is Fred Ponslaw. Yeah, yeah. 
and I haven't seen, I knew him, and I haven't seen him in a hundred years. Fred's a very sweet guy. He was yeah. an actor, he has one writing credit, and it's the film you produced. Yeah, but his, okay. his focus really so, was acting. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, right. so hold hold that thought. Yeah. I'm going to run through a bunch of films quickly. Oh, I want to, okay. I just want to make a point. So, yeah. Brilliant, Fred. One, one writing script. Next film, Jericho Mansions. Another great cast, James Caan, jean vivre Bujold. Only writing credit for one writer, Harriet Sand, and the only English uh, language feature credit for Alberto Scam, the other writer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Next film, The Heart is a Deceitful, The Heart is Deceitful Above All Things, another great yeah. film with Asia Argento, who directed it and uh, acted in it. And it's with Asia Argento, Jeremy Renner, uh, uh, and Marilyn Manson, and Winona Ryder, and Peter Fonda. I mean, your cast drive me nuts. They're crazy. Um, Asia Argento's, uh, this was her earliest film that was not in Italian, both as a writer and a director. Oh, I didn't realize that. Now we go to Candy Stripers, and you That's have so the only writing credit for, there were two writers on Candy Stripers, which yeah. is a, a huge film, I mean, it's become a standard, right? Yeah. So Candy, 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 yeah. Candy Stripers had two writers, Jill Garson, yeah. who happens to be someone that I've worked with a lot, yeah, I and, <laughs> and, Kate, and Kate Robbins, of course. Yeah. The only yeah. writing credit for either of those two women, the only writing credit, now we go to Seance. Mark Smith, first feature writing credit, his only directing credit. We go to Desert of Blood, Don Henry's only feature writing credit. We go to The Chaperone, another great film, S.J. Roth's only writing credit. All right, that was his first. Okay, now, right. now, now we come to The Calling, and we've got a, a novelist. It's based on a novel by Inger Ash Wolf. It's her only produced novel, and the writer, and, and, and Jason Stone, who you mentioned, well, yeah. is his only feature-length directing credit. Basically, you can't stand not breaking someone in. Every <laughs> film on every side of the camera, you are, I mean, it is, so Suzanne, do, like, do you make it a point, you say, no, you've been produced, uh, you've been in a produced film, I'll never work with you? <laughs> I didn't even realize it until you read the mock theory. I swear to God, I had no idea. I really didn't. I mean, maybe there's something that the common denominator is the fact that it's indie film. So, you know, we try to put these teams together of people who are really hungry to get themselves out there and make something happen. Maybe so, that's got something. To so that, that's what I want to ask you. I mean, now yeah. that we're bringing, bringing it to light, I mean, yeah. I can, I can think of a number of mo motivations, a number of reasons why it logically makes sense, but to see this pattern so complete. So... We can we find people who have a certain appetite, a certain hunger, a motivation uh, yeah. to to see their their product, their stories told, you know, produced as film, mm -hmm. uh, and so there's a little bit more flexibility. It's not going to be studio level monies, right. perhaps. Right, right, um, right. Uh, and for you, you know, that's that's a big deal as a producer. Uh, and yet, you also have to balance that with you raise all all your budgets, you raise the financing in most every instance. So. You know that's an interesting. So, what's your what? Tell me, your you know, looking back on this, did it make fundraising easier, harder? Uh, was it just more fun to champion these new storytellers? Tell me your thought about it looking back. No, I, I wasn't. I don't think it was that at all. I just happened. For example, I didn't even really know that it was Fred. For example, using Undertaking Betty <clears throat> for script. I just happened. Kate and I just happened to hear about the script to a friend of ours. Read it, fell in love with it. <clears throat> Did, didn't even do a rewrite. I mean, it was just perfect the way it came in, and we just happened to fall in love with the script. Like so, I think with each time, I didn't really notice uh, that aspect of it that you're pointing out. It was really more about uh, liking that particular project or liking that particular director, like with Alberto. Um, you know. I, I wanted to work with him. I knew friends of his. Uh, I heard he was wonderful to work with. Kate and I had just worked with his two best friends uh, on an, on Undertaking Betty, so I was curious to kind of get to know him. So it was really more about wanting to work with him, not even realizing, like you were saying, that you know there was some first on there, and um, and who some of the other. I mean, yeah, and Kate and Jill, obviously Kate was my film partner for a number of years, so wanting to see one of her projects come to life in the form of Candy Stripers was a real treat. I think that I really wasn't focused on any one thing. It was just projects that I liked, people that I liked, and uh, it really wasn't about the, the, the money. I mean, the money really, the, raising the money was really more 
then you start working on the marketing elements and the marketing aspects of it. So, right. so a lot of times the writer and a lot of times even the director at the indie level are not going to be the names that mean anything to the marketing people out there in the world. It's really more the actors. A lot of the time, of course. So, so let's. Uh, that's the next thing I want to shift to is the actors, because you have a uh, a very consistent history of attracting uh, pretty amazing talent. I mean, Naomi Watts, Christopher Walken, James Caan, Jean Vier Bujol. I mean, these are all household names as we go down this list. Mm -hmm. uh, often with you know enough seasoning, they've got international appeal. Yeah. Um, so, uh, number one, uh, I, there's two parts to this question. One is how do you attract them to these uh, more modestly budgeted films. In fact, let's start with that. What is generally the range of budgets that I'm uh, that you would that you would attach to these movies? I'm sure there's quite a range, but what's what's the yeah, what are we the, talking about? The first four that you mentioned uh, would be between five to ten million, right? Um, or four to ten, depending on the country, you know. Um, and then when well, there was a couple of things that happened as to why we then switched to more of the thrillers and the lower budget. And that was uh, when England started changing their laws at the end of 2004 and the U.S. Uh, opened up 181, you know, the Job Creation Act where you had the 100% tax write-off uh, for investors, depending, of course, on their, on their, uh, their uh, amount of income. That's when we decided to kind of focus on making American films. And at that point, the director field had lobbied to really work with the, the unions out here to stop the runaway production and be much more open to shooting in America at the same time as the uh, Section 181 happened, but they were responsible for 181. And then SAG and the director's guild also became far more flexible in terms of the rates. And then at the same time, it all happened at the same time, then the digital camera started to become something that was commonplace. And that's when we uh, decided to kind of do the SAG also low, the SAG modified. All of a sudden, the responsibility is doing movies for $200,000 that look as good as the ones that I had just done for $5 million two years prior, or a year prior. So we thought, hey, let's come back here. Our husbands lived here, and, and uh, they're cute, you know. And so we had a chance to, you know, come back and work uh, on American soil, which was very nice for us as indie film producers. Which before that, our focus really was foreign, was international co-production. That's really right. what the world was in the 90s yeah. and right up to 2004, with that international co-production. You know. All right. So, I, I, Suzanne, I want to come back to yeah. I want to come back uh, to uh, th this idea of what we, you know what we what we required um, more money, more capital, more fundraising okay. uh, to achieve earlier. Some some not so many years ago, we can do right. for for hundreds of thousands versus millions of dollars. Yeah. So, uh, so I wanna, I, that's that's really crucial. I want to talk about that for a little bit. But before we before we do again. Um, Looking at these films, I want to go back. We were talking about these amazing actors, these casts that you assembled. So, sure. when you're putting together a film in that modest budget register, let's call it a four or five, six, whatever million dollar film, yeah. mm -hmm. describe for people as succinctly as you can. Um, I have a. I'm the producer. I have a. Well, you are. You have a script. You um, you may or may you don't have your money probably firmly in place right up front because you don't have your elements correct. Right, I had none, and I always started with like that. Yeah. Right, so you, there it is. You with your script against the world. Right. Uh, now you want to go out and you want to go to these names. You want to go to the 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 talent and the representatives, the managers and agents of these actors, these name actors, and you have a script in your hand. Right. And you may have a director who's not done a bunch of films. So tell tell people from a very pragmatic standpoint, like how do you stitch that together? Because we we would imagine that a lot of agents representing a name actor or someone who's a working actor yeah. would say, "Bring me a cash offer." Yeah. Uh, you know that there would be these tension points. How do you get through that process? Yeah. Basically, at the time, Kate and I really didn't know what the hell we were doing. So that helped, I think, because we had no fear. You know what I mean? Like we yeah. really didn't know there was a problem. <laughs> didn't know it was an issue. Ignorance is bliss. So we had no money for uh, obviously casting directors or attorneys or anything at that point. We had no money at all when we started. And um, <clears throat> and so what we did have though is enough sense 
to, to research and study our market. Um, and what I notice a lot of the time, Gary, when I'm teaching, you know, the flash forward courses, the old marketing courses we used to do, or the indie film classes years ago, what I notice is a lot of people don't do the homework and they don't do the research. <clears throat> you know, they came out to the industry, you know, any other industry in the world, you have to train. You know, you've got to train for years to be a doctor or a lawyer or, or anything, you know, stockbroker. And here all of a sudden, oh, I know how to write a script. Hell, you know, I can write. I can, uh, you know, I mean, people move out here and thinking, oh, it's not a problem, I'll just do it. Without really putting some of the, the I think that important research and, and homework into it. So what Kate and I did is our the minute we decided we wanted to open Snowfall Films, we went to AFM, the American Film Market, and we went to every single floor and we met every single person in that building at the lowest hotel, you know, down in, in Santa Monica. We shook hands. I could have been a politician for all, all the hands that I shook. I honestly, God, that seven days, honestly. Unbelievable. There was not nobody was safe. We met everybody, and we got, and we said, "What are you looking for? What are the names that you need? What are the budget sizes that work? What genres are working? What's not working?" I mean, we really, really learned our industry. And the so, second so, thing. So wait before you, okay before you go to the second point, hold that thought. Yeah. So you're talking about the AFM. Yeah. The uh, American film market that happens at the Lowe's Hotel here in Santa Monica every year. Yeah. And so just so people understand, many do, many some won't, is the, the people that are populating and, and the hotels overrun. I mean, it's a, it's a very intense week with yeah, people right. from all over the world who are basically yeah. representing, they're the sales, they're the film buyers, they're the representatives of the market of Turkey, of Japan, of Britain, of all over the world, people yeah. from all over the world who are buying product. And you need to find out which talent in which part of the world makes sense before you actually make firm commitments. So it's a very interesting information exchange as well as a sales process. Exactly. Because Kate and I didn't know at that point, even though we didn't know if we were going to go studio or if we were going to go indie, I think our inclination was that we were probably more indie producers, but we wanted to have both doors open. So we were still making phone calls to studio pitching projects. You know, same with Undertaking Betty. I made, I think we did 46 calls or something. Or I'm sorry, we got it. We made probably 100 calls. We got it into 46 different companies who were looking for romantic comedies and comedies at the time. So I'm not saying we didn't go the studio route. We did try that, but at the same time, we kind of knew we'd probably be going the end route. So that's why we wanted to study the marketplace, the international marketplace. So if we ended up producing this on our own and having to raise the money on our own. What would be the names that we'd be looking at? Who would we need to put on ourselves? so that we could then bring on a sales agent who could do back in those days pre-sales. Pre-sales were a big part of, of, your, um, of your budget, really. I mean, a lot of your budget, 40, 50, 60 percent um, or more. So uh, we needed to kind of study that world. So when we realized that studio was not the way we wanted to go, because what we noticed with studio is when we would do the pitch, because I'm very good at pitching, and when we would do those pitches, you know, I remember calling a couple of them saying, you know, I've got this great, I say, what are you looking for? And they say, well, something different and unique and unusual and, and funny. And I'm going, oh, my God, I've got it. It's Undertaking Betty. It was all positive view at the time. And I'm going, and they say, oh, my God, that's great. It's, yeah, it's funny and unique and all this exact same words. Two weeks later, I call and I say, what do you think? They say, ah, oh, the best script I've ever read. And they'd be laughing. You could tell they were bent over laughing, going, it's so good. And, said, and they said, oh, we love it so much and we're passing. I said, what the hell do you mean? You're passing. You just said you loved it. Best thing you ever read. Yes, it's, well, you know, it's, it's too unique and unusual and funny. The very words that they asked for were the words that they passed on. You know what I mean? So I think what we got to realize, sort of about 46 phone calls for me to finally get it, that what they, what they couldn't do was make their own decisions. You know what I mean? Because, and it really is the truth, if they try something different and it doesn't work at the box office, come Monday morning, those people get fired. I mean, in real life, they get fired a lot of the time. So I get why they had that fear. And I remember saying to Kate, you know, when we had that last phone call, I called Kate and I said, well, you know, same thing again. You know, they love our project and they're passing. And that's when we said, okay, enough already. You know, we'll take this on. We'll do it ourselves. We'll have some fun with it. And we had done enough research that we, we decided, okay, you know, let's, let's first of all take it out of the U.S. at the time because, it, it, you know, it's just very difficult to try to do anything 
you know, at movies of this size, certainly, you know, when the movie, when the studio kind of dominated back then, this was 2000, 2001, and uh, so we said, all right, if we had our choice, who would it be as an actor? If we didn't even think country, even though we were kind of thinking not, not U.S. in a sense, but what would it be? And we had just seen the Academy Awards the Saturday before for the second time, the second the nomination two times in, the, in the two years had gone to Brenda Blessing. Uh, for her roles, and we were in love, just in love with her. And the script, the lead, was uh, a woman in her 50s who falls in love for the first time with the town undertaker. And uh, so we said, "Oh my God, it's Brenda Blessing." And what was so smart about that? Because we didn't, we we didn't just haphazardly do this. We strategically did this, Gary, because you know a lot of times people say, "Oh my gosh, well I need, I, I need Chris Walken. I, I'm, I need the marketable name. I need." Um, and, you know, give me another big name. You know, I need the I need the big name on here. But we didn't have the wherewithal uh, at the time to get that big name. Every time I called uh, Chris, it was actually Joe Pesci originally. Uh, every time I called his his, his attorney, who was the same as Chris's, um, I would start with Hi, my name is Suzanne Lyons. You know, from Twelve Films. I don't have any money, but and you know, he always hung up on me. That was kind of a funny joke for about two years actually. <laughs> <laughs> and a lot of people hung up on me, but that's okay. Um, and they missed, you know, <laughs> the opportunity. And um, so, but what happened is we thought, you know, Brenda is, yes, it's not a big giant name. She's classy. She's sophisticated. She's a brilliant actress. She's the kind of people that person actor that other actors want to work with. So let's put somebody like that on board. Let's go classy. Let's go sophisticated. Let's go that road. It, you know, it's not it, it, it's not a you know, really giant name, but it's somebody that other people want to work with. So yeah, I, I, it, yeah. And just, just to interrupt for a moment, Suzanne, I think it's really important for people to understand what smart strategy that is on so many levels because when you pick someone like Brenda, who is not only uh, absolutely spot on for the role, I mean, she's the perfect casting for the role, but she is also considered an actor's actor or an actor's actress yeah. in this case. Yeah. Uh, and, and so uh, w other talent um, of all stripes, not just actors, mm -hmm. other talent mm -hmm. that you're going after, yeah. it could be an editor, it could be a lot of different kinds of talent, and mm -hmm. their representatives, their agent, their manager, their lawyer, mm -hmm. when you start talking to people inside the beltway and say, yeah, I've got this script and it's with Brenda Beth Blethen, et cetera, now you, you've really expanded the frame. You've created a welcome mat. It's harder for people to throw darts at your project when you've got someone of that caliber. Well, that's, so that's what often, yeah. oftentimes it's better not to go after the lead role mm -hmm. um, when you when you don't have budget. I mean, if you have look, if you can write a check and say I'm making you a cash offer, of, then oh, go well, after whoever you want. Knock yourself out, exactly. Right. But but m m m most of the indie world doesn't have that right up front. Yeah. You earn your way to that. And that said, it's often really brilliant. I don't, I don't want to call it trick casting, but to be strategic. Yeah, yeah. And go, and go after your second tier of actor who will help attract. And also, if you have a younger director, to get someone like Brenda in a supporting or secondary role to approve right. that younger you director is actually very crucial because psychologically now the bigger actor for the lead comes in they know someone of her ilk has already blessed your director. So there's a lot of reasons why what you're describing. I just want people to appreciate the different facets of that strategy. Yeah, I mean, she really was perfect for the role. Somebody that we wanted, and it turned out to be a really, you know, it really was going in the right direction. We didn't have the director at the time, actually. So, and we had absolutely no money, not even five cents. So to be able to include her into, you know, Brenda, who who you love, you know, who's a director that you really admire and would love to work with, and, and could we look at some of the people you recommend, you know? And then what happened when I called Joe's um, uh, attorney back, you know, a, a week later and saying, hi, Suzanne Lyons again, you know, don't have any money, but don't hang up. And I, I got a great script, and I got Frank Blackman, and he said, we're in. And I said, but I haven't pitched yet. And he said, but we're in. And I said, you don't know what the project is yet. He said, I don't care, Suzanne, I'm telling you, you got Brenda Blessing, we're in. Yeah. And he said, I said, okay, let me do the pitch. I have to do the pitch because it's so funny. And when I told the story, and I said, can I at least send it over so we can read the darn thing? <laughs> he said, yes, go ahead, send it. And of course, two and a half hours later, he called me back and said, he read it. Like I said, he read it. 
and then the rest was much easier because then with the name, you know, and Brenda, and then being able to then put the, the director on board after that, and then we look for a British partner to team up with, and then we throw Penella through our sales agent and see what she has to say because I always like to check with the sales agent to make sure if we start the next set of names, of course, that we get some other marketable names for her yeah. or him to go out and do their, um, their market, uh, you know, their, their so the, so, so the strategy at Snowfall Films is to create a snowball um, effect, which is, much. you know, which, which is really exactly <laughs> what you're, what you're, what you're describing. Yes. The representative, if, you know, with Brenda, you get access to every talent she's ever worked with, including the directors, not just the other actors. That's right. Yeah. yeah. And he was right. the same when he was IPM. Mm -hmm. Actors love to work with people they had a successful experience with. Yeah. So yeah. that opens everything up. So on both sides of the equator, both parts of the conversation, right. uh, it's a huge advantage. So that was, that was uh, fascinating and very, very smart to do it that way. Yeah, and sometimes sometimes things are, are, are a little bit where they work in your favor. Like we, I knew that we wanted Maribel Verdu, for example. Uh, her name was very big, kind of like what Julia Roberts was, you know, to the U.S. at that point. For, I'm talking about Jericho Manson's now, which is a year later, 2001, shot in 2002. And uh, we really wanted Maribel Verdu, but nobody was getting Maribel Verdu, you know. And she just didn't want to work. She didn't need to work outside the thing. Why bother, you know? Just didn't, right. She just didn't care to, and um, and but yet we found out that she and her husband are huge fans of Jimmy Jim, James Bond, and uh, so it really helped when we put Jimmy on board the project to be able to call her agent back and say we've got James Bond, and that was one of those situations we're in. And I said, don't you want to read the script? Sure, send it. But we're in. <laughs> like she said, Mirabelle loves Jimmy, you know. So it was it was great. So. That kind of thing, and then we also looked at Canada because I guess we had James, which was great for, for a lot of the world, and for the U.S. Maribel, obviously, for for Europe at the time, gigantic, and then Jennifer Kelly because she had so she has a huge um, Asian um, audience as well as Canada. So so I was always looking, even though I'm not a sales agent, I always try to look at the global market as to which you know actors are going to sell, and then see if we can piece them together. And I never do anything without the okay of a sales agent. It doesn't mean I'm going to use that sales agent in the long run. Who knows, nowadays you may self-distribute, for heaven's sakes, right? But back yeah, then, it didn't yeah. mean I was going to use them. Obviously, in the case of undertaking Betty, it was different. It was our first project. It was great, uh, obviously, great uh, pre-sales back then, so it really behooved a person to put on a sales agent just to do the pre-sales. Nowadays, it's not the case, of course. So, but it doesn't matter. Even today, I still have very close friends that are sales agents, and I call them and I say, listen, Here's who we're looking at for this movie right now. Are these names worth the sales you need to you know, triple the size? If our budget is $2 million, then you want to know you're getting at least $6 million in order to make your investors happy or whoever it happens to be. So, um, you know, and if a sales agent says, no, because then those two names don't add up, you need two more or you need to go bigger on the lead, okay, great, thanks. And then I'll call her back with the next list, you know, that I have. So right. it, you really got to be smart about it, and it's really important to be smart about it for your investors as well because they're putting the money in. You know, um, even if it's international and you're getting a lot of money from Telefilm or you're getting money from the British Fund uh, lottery or whatever, I still think it's you've got to really, really put the business hat on and think smart about the kind of actors that are selling and talk to your sales agents first. I think that's the, when I in my book I mention that all the time, all the time, that you've really got to be looking at the marketplace. It's not just enough to wear the creative hat. You've got to wear the business hat all the time. It makes me crazy. Uh, which goes to a great question. Of the films that you've produced, and it's, you know, we're going on better than, you know, we've got at least two handfuls right here, and there's a couple more coming. Mm -hmm. So, you you know, in, in you've, been, you've been averaging a, a good number of, you know, like a film a year, yeah. uh, almost, yeah. Yeah. about. So, that's interesting, because since you've been r raising the money for the majority of these films, how many investors have carried over from one film to another because you've worn that business hat and been responsible to them? Uh, that we, we were using a phenomenal British group, actually, that was undertaking Betty. Even though we had a lot of, we did well in terms of pre-sales. We did almost, I think, 1.8 million in pre-sales, and the budget was around 3.8 or something like that, um, U.S. Uh, 
or pounds, I can't remember, of the U.S. So we needed to kind of match that. We really needed to match that because we were not going to be, we were shooting in Wales, so we were not going to be getting a lot of incentives like you do today, you know, if you're doing a co-production and you're doing percentage from Canada or wherever you happen to be shooting. We didn't have tax incentives in Wales. So we really needed pure equity to match up with our pure, um, our, uh, what do you call it? our, our uh, sales that we got from the different countries at the time. And then we had a 10% gap, which everybody did. You know, we all worked with those who were with back then and got our 10% gap. So, um, what, uh, so that particular company came forward with us on, on the next project as well. And then when we were doing daily billions, that's when we started to work with a more Canada, U.S. You know, mind you, Canada, U.K., we also did with Jericho Mansion. So we did get some money from, from Canada, from, from the province and from uh, of the government, the, and the federal government, and then Bailey's Billings, which looking at the posters here on the wall. And then Bailey's, we got a fair amount of money from Telefilm, as well as incentives at the time. So we didn't need as much of the investor, as much investor money as we needed before. So we, we went to a different group. Then, uh, when it came, however, to answer your question, to, to move back to the States a little bit so people, I think, can. Um, uh, to, in today's world without the pre sales. What happened with candy strikers? 50, I did a statistic for one of my classes I was teaching. So with, um, with candy strikers, and we were moving on to SEANCE, which was the low budget, the SEG ultra low, 51%, 51 or 52% of the investors from candy strikers came forward into SEANCE, for example. Yeah. So they were very so, happy campers. So Suzanne, you know, you're talking about all these different. I'm hearing lots of considerations in terms of how you finance, where you source your money um, from the British fund, and depending on what jurisdiction you're shooting in, sure. uh, you know what kinds of investors, what kinds of incentive programs, government-backed programs, uh, et cetera. Um, if 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 someone were, if someone had a script that could, whether it's somewhere in 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 one of the states or whether it's abroad, yeah. um, and they were looking for someone who has produced films at a more modest level, right? So, because uh, we're going to go for a moment, I want to turn oh, the sure. conversation in a minute to what's possible today. But let's assume you're making yeah. films for a couple of several million dollars or less, and you're working with red cameras, you're working with this gear, you have a lot more fluidity or flexibility. Yeah. Um, how do they, how would, is there a clever way to begin to identify the producers who are fluent with the kinds of entrepreneurial producing, what I'll call entrepreneurial producing, uh, where they really know how to put these projects together, get film grants, go get rebates, go get incentive monies, et cetera, uh, where they've done this repeatedly. How, how would you, if you were a screenwriter with a great project that was well tailored, yeah. uh, how would you go about researching or identifying producers like Suzanne Lyons? Well, I think what I would do is kind of look I know because you're right, the obvious research would be the studios, which you can go online and find, you know, because it's coming out, what, you know, whatever's on the, at the box office this week, you can easily go and find out, you know, who that company is and, you know, at Paramount and, you know, and call them. The problem is, a lot of times with the studio movies, they're doing less studio movies nowadays, and a lot of the time they don't necessarily want to see your screenplay because they've got a box of screenplays that came in that morning from CAA. And another big box that came in just that morning, not the afternoon, just the morning, from ICM and from all those different agencies and all the boutique agencies. Boxes and boxes and boxes. Of, and honestly, like on a daily basis. <clears throat> so you're competing with a lot of those, those people already. Um, so I would say to do what you just said, and that is go to those companies, like see who, has, who were the winners at Sundance, uh, you know, those kind of those more those indie film festivals. Uh, and see who are those winners, who are those producers that are out there doing that sort of thing. And those films that you really like, like what are some of the films that you like that are by independent producers? Uh, you know, if you're somebody who loves art house kind of projects and you're writing art house films, then I would probably do the research in that arena. If you're somebody who loves thrillers and you love some of the indie, kind of indie thrillers, then I would look in that arena. But I would definitely do my research. And if it means getting a mentor, I'm a big fan, and you know this, of getting mentors. And yeah. maybe your mentor, so maybe I'm not the person for your project, but if I wasn't shooting right now, maybe I'd be a good mentor. So maybe if a mentor means 
you know, maybe two 10 minute conversations we have over the next month where you say, here's what I'm up to, here's what I'm doing. You so know, you might have your ear closer to the ground, Suzanne, I'm living up in Cincinnati here, and you're there in LA. Any ideas you could give me? I would start to get mentors, two or three or four mentors, where you do it, you know, define amount of time with them, you know, a, a coffee or, or a 10 minute phone call or something like that, and then pick their brain as to who they recommend. I start following the festivals of the genres that are yours. If it's horror that you're writing, then check out the Chicago Horror Festival and the Shocker Fest and the UK uh, festivals and see who are the winners of those, who are those projects that you like, who are the producers and the directors that are producing those and directing those, and then start getting in touch with them. Um, Can and I put a question in here? Yeah. Um, you, you talk about picking up the phone and making these phone calls, which I think yeah. is probably a very, very daunting first step for a newcomer. When you first started, how did you, how did you get yourself riled up to make that first step, and how did you not take no as an answer? Um, I think, how did I get riled up to make it? Uh, sometimes what I would do, unless I was getting my pitch ready, I'd option to start, let's take over to Betty, and I had my pitch ready, and I felt pretty confident, and then I'd run it by Kate, or we'd run it by each other that morning. Um, and we did have fear, you know, not like we were without fear, but we made sure that we created an at stakeness so that fear wouldn't get in the way. So if I had 10 companies that I was going to call that morning, and if I didn't call them all, uh, if, you know, if I held out because of my fear, then by lunch I would owe her $20. And, oh. then she, and, and same thing with her. So I'm somebody who, I'm just going to be the kind of person where I need an at stakeness, call that stakeness. Um, you know, and if it's, if it's $100, so be it, if that's going to get my ass on the phone, you know what I mean? It's like, so because I'm going to have fear blocks too, I don't have a lot of fear, uh, because I usually give it, in Flash Road I used to teach what's called a 10 second upset, you know, I say give it about 10 seconds and then move on, you know, pick up the phone, do a practice what we call phone aerobics, where we just practice picking up the phone, I think that's really <laughs> silly. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and then what I would do is I would take my easiest one uh, of those companies, and it might be somebody that I knew, maybe, you know, uh, Beth Ann, maybe you had a friend that you told me about who worked over at Amazon.com or whatever, and so I said, okay, I've got, a, I've got somebody that I can actually mention as a friend of Gary, so that's my easier call. And then I would actually start the call with a bit of fun, saying, listen, you're my first call, you know, I'm making my pitches. This week, I'm um, kind of nervous about it. You know, if there's a white elephant in the room, I tell them there's a white elephant in the room, right? I'm more than a little nervous, I have to tell you. Um, so, uh, but because, you know, you, we have a mutual friend, I thought I'd start with you. You're so lucky. I'm probably going to totally mess up. But I hope that's okay. <laughs> and if you, need me to, if you need to hang up halfway through because it's appalling, go ahead. Or if you need me to go jump in the lake, tell me. I've got my kids to stand by. <laughs> you know, like I make a little kind of about a joke or whatever, you know. I've jumped in many a lake, you know. Um, so, uh, and that's what I would do. I'd just be honest with the person. And then by the second call, I'd be a little bit more comfortable. And then by the third, I'd be on a roll and then, you know, off and running for the week. And back then, our ratios were pretty good, Kate and I. Like, if it, back then, when we were doing a lot of those kinds of calls to the studios, to get it into those 46 companies, it probably wasn't 100 call. In our case, it was probably about 60 to 70 because we were pretty good on the phone. Uh, you know, at that time, because we just kind of had some fun with it. And that's the other thing, is we never took it too awfully seriously. I'm not saying we didn't wear the business hat, we did. You know, I'm, my God, my background, I was a VP, first female, actually, VP in Atlantic Canada in television, broke that cement ceiling at the time. Kate was a stockbroker for many years. I mean, we had great business backgrounds, the two of us. And, um, uh, so, you know, it's not that we didn't wear the business hat, but we also had a lot of fun doing it. Our mandate was really having fun. If it ain't fun, we ain't doing it. You know what I mean? It's like that's the way we work. And we did a business plan for ourselves. If we were going to be doing 50 phone calls, we mapped them out. Who were the people we were calling? What were the phone numbers? We put it on the wall. What was the timeline? What was our ratio that we wanted to hit that week? We had some fun with that too. You know, we really made it kind of a game. We made everything a game. And then if we didn't make the number of calls, then we would kind of look at ourselves and say, okay, because I used to, it's so fun to blame it on somebody else, you know? Like some people say, oh, Suzanne, you know, they're not taking my calls or, or whatever. Like I hear all kinds of stories all the time. 
and I'm thinking, or you know, I get the ten pitches, but I only got one person who wants to read it. And uh, there's really something wrong with those other nine, you know, vice presidents, you know, that they're not getting it. And I'm thinking, no, there's never anything wrong over there. There's only always something wrong over here. And I don't mean wrong like beating yourself up. I mean wrong like saying, what was missing in my speaking that they weren't getting the excitement and the passion of this project? What were, what was I not saying? Who was I not being that was not getting that across to them? And then uh, I got at that. Fantastic. Absolutely fantastic. And I love the fact that you're the honesty that this is my first call, this is my first week doing this, you know, give me a break, help me out, forgive my stumbles, you know, I that's a great way of going about it. Because those phone calls are scary. You know, when you really want something so badly and it's a yes or a no at the end of the phone, that's that's a lot of pressure. Yeah, yeah. Sometimes at the first week, sometimes I would be so scared, I would do a call at lunchtime so they'd be gone. You know what I mean? I <laughs> so you leave a message. <laughs> yeah, but I left killer messages, like killer <laughs> messages. And then they'd call me back laughing at 2.30 when they get back from lunch saying, this, I don't know who you are, but this message was funny. You've got to tell me more about this project. You know? Perfect. So sometimes when I'm so scared, <laughs> that's what I do. <laughs> so. Perfect. Mm. Yeah. Great point there, Gary. Yeah, no, that's brilliant. Tell on yourself before others. It's the old Eminem eight mile, you know, wrap, tell it, wrap, wrap your own t tail. Uh, yeah. And and then other people, you know, it's like, the, the, okay, you gave the elephant a name. It's there's an elephant in the room. Exactly. Uh, and 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 I love that you make it. Uh, there are two pieces there that I think are also really crucial. One is make it fun. Have a little fun with it because if yeah. if it's fun for you, it's fun for the other person. Oh, good. Yeah, yeah. Right. It's it's like any relation, any moment. We we're we're kind of feeling the same vibe. Mm -hmm. um, and and the other point that I was going to make just went right out of my brain, but it was brilliant. Of you, because <laughs> uh, you are br you are brilliant. Um, but no, the, the idea the idea the idea that you ga that you gamify and you actually because that's goals, but yeah. gamified goals and say, look, yeah. I want to make ten calls today. And I really want to hit, you know, three out of ten, or four out of ten, or yeah. five, whatever it is. I want a second call, or I want a submission, or I want, I want this many callbacks. I want this many submissions. I want, and it's okay if I fail six out of ten times. That's okay, yeah. right? Just for the fun of it. And I know with a lot of times, because I used to teach goal setting with Flash Forward Institute. That's what it was about. Remember, it was that month long course years yeah. ago, where you would take on a project that was bigger, that would take you six months to a year, and do it in thirty days. And you know, in my and the whole idea, people are scared to set goals. First of all, they're scared to set goals. And I think partly they're scared to set goals a lot of the time because they think it's it's also silly, not just scared, that it's like, oh no, I'm just gonna let you know, let the universe decide the way it's gonna be. Where with me, I look at goals as an opportunity to expand. You know? It's not just about the acquisition. It's not just about, oh, gee, they're going to get to read the screenplay. Yes, that's fun. Acquisition is always fun. Getting the goal accomplished is fun. But the expansion is more fun. You know, meeting that person, even if they say no, you get there's another relationship you've got over, you know, at that company, at Gracie Films, whatever, you know. So it may not be the script for them, but there's a new relationship in there somewhere. So, I mean, it's like you expanding, you getting braver with each phone call. That's expansion. It's not about the acquisition, you know what I mean, by the acquiring of the goal, right. the end result. It's more about the fun and the playing that goes along with expanding as you're doing it. And yeah, I suppose we, more flying hours you have behind you, the more confidence you get and the more oops, fun you're able to have. Finality really yeah. comes out and then you're getting the callbacks. Yeah, until the next project and then I get scared all over again. You know, then it's like, oh shit, something new to pitch. You know, uh, today actually, I've got a, there's a Christmas project I'm working on that is, I have to say, the best Christmas romantic comedy. I've probably one of the best scripts I've ever read in my entire career. Honest to God, that good. And I was just as scared today doing that one as I probably was 12 years ago <laughs> doing Undertaking Daddy. <laughs> well, I think that's also great for people to know that are starting out here that. You know, when there's when your passion is on the line, you are allowed to have that fear. And if you don't have that fear, you probably don't have the passion. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's all part of the emotion that goes along with it. You know, you just have to like Gary said, you know, tell one on yourself and just have fun with it. If you're nervous, you're nervous. You know, you know what? It, it's a healthy. It's a fear is a healthy thing. It's 
it, it means that you care. It means that you've got skin in the game and you're really invested in this idea, which is what keeps you going when you start to get people saying, maybe not. And you say, that's fine. I deepen my relationship with you on to the next. But yeah. you have to have something that drives you down that path. Uh, and I think fear is, is the flip side of, you know, I'm excited. I love this. I really want this to happen. Um, but the more you do what you say, you know, it's like you're, you may be as afraid today as you were 12 years ago, but here's the difference. Because you found a way to cause yourself to pick up that phone repeatedly, yeah. you yeah. have how many relationships today that you didn't have 12 years ago? Oh, my God, yeah. We, we, there were, I don't think there was one, one company at any student. There was nobody we did not know. I would have to say that. Honest to God, I think... Like I said before, nobody was safe, and I don't just mean at AFM. I mean in the studio world. We had, we we there was every single development person. I think at every single studio, every company at every studio, I knew because of those phone calls in those early days. Because Do you keep in touch with those people after you're finished with them? Do you I make did, a I did at the time when we were doing those projects that were like the four to eight, you know, four to ten million. We, we stayed in touch because those were the people that we were still going out to pitch to. And also, when we were doing the, we were looking also to do the bigger studio movies. So we were definitely still pitching, hoping that, you know, kind of a bit like Hope, um, which was more of a 60 million, 80 million, like some of the bigger projects that we had taken on. 100 million, you know. So we were still doing those kind of pitches. We stayed in touch with those people. Once we started in, in 2004, when the world flipped around a little bit, um, and, uh, you know, like I said before, when things changed here and things started going low, lower budget and we started having a little fun with that whole lower budget world, that's when I kind of did keep up the relationship. And, to, and I'm sorry that I didn't. It's funny, I was looking at my map the other day. We had a flash photo called a map of relationships, you know, where you put all the directors you know, all the actors you know, all the different categories of all the people you know. So you get a real sense on the wall of who's missing, who's all, all the great people you know. But if you're somebody who's looking for a director and, you know, 20 actors and 50 writers and two directors, you don't want to beat yourself up. You want to say, oh, got it. That's a wake-up call. That area is missing. I need to meet more directors. So, you know, when I looked at that recently, I was kind of thinking, you know what, I wish I had stayed more in touch with some of those people. And I actually, I actually made a list the other day from a few of my favorite people from back then of as soon as I finished this movie. Uh, I'm going to call and say, let's get together, let's come in for coffee, or let's go to lunch, or whatever. Um, especially some of the women, you know, some of the women were, were stayed a little bit more in touch back then. Um, I want to get back in touch again. And it's funny that you mentioned that because I was literally thinking about that, that this month, how I wish I'd stayed connected in some way. And nowadays we can more, of course, with the internet and, you know, and everything. Yeah, else. of course, but yeah. Can you please thing. add me to your list of women? Because I'd love to meet you in person. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I think we women, we really want to, you know, do that extra support too, you know. And sometimes I play some, some fun games in terms of if there's people I really need to know that I don't know, and I was sharing this recently when I was teaching a class at, uh, at Columbia College this spring. Um, somebody was saying how they really, really, really wanted to meet, um, I forget what it was now, let's say, uh, Casting director. I actually can't remember what he asked for. Casting director, and he was complaining about the fact that he couldn't get to meet casting directors. And one of the things I used to do, and I did this with the producers guild one time years ago, because I wanted to meet people who were doing bigger budgets years ago. You know, because not years ago. Actually, I was thinking about it more recently, about four or five years ago, because I had kind of mastered up to the 10 million, but I wanted to kind of break that mold and, and look at projects that were 15 to 20. Was one of my new goals about four years ago. So I put together um, a panel, and any any company, women in film, producer guild, any organization on the planet would be thrilled for you to say, "I'm going to moderate a panel for you, and I'm going to take on getting this." Yes. They would kill right now at a women in film for you to go and do that. So there's no excuse why you, for example, as a person, couldn't meet those six casting directors because now. He's not calling as an actor. He's calling as a moderator, representing in a film, for example, putting together this, you know, for a group of 100 people, where he's not responsible for women and bringing in 100 people, other members, but he's putting it together in the green room beforehand, just like you and I today chatting in the green room. Uh, he's now on the same playing field with them. 
He's the one making them feel comfortable, introducing them to each other, sharing what questions he's going to be asking them. So All of a sudden, he knows six new uh, people. He's mm -hmm. got six new people for his map of relationships that he now has a relationship with. You know, that's what happened. That's why I got to meet Michelle Shane. It all happened because of that panel at the producer's floor. You know, there was one on my right and one on my left, but I, at the end of the panel, I knew the two people that I wanted to get to really know more, and one that I really wanted to be a mentor, and I called Michelle to thank him a week later and asked if he'd be my mentor. We had a half-hour coffee meeting at Starbucks down in Beverly Hills, and he said yes. And uh, we got chatting, and at the end of the call, at the end of our little meeting, after he gave me the advice I was wanting on my strategic plan and everything, he said, you know, Suzanne, I think I'd like to read one of the projects you option. Just so for our next, you know, get together, my next mentor meeting with you, I get a sense of, of what you're looking, you know, what you're doing, the kind of stuff you love. So that night I sent him Joe's honor. The next morning he called me and he said, I just have to tell you I'm no longer your mentor. I went, oh my God, Michelle, I'm so sorry because I offended you somewhere yesterday. I feel so terrible. What have I done? He said, no, I'm not your mentor because I'm your new film partner. Oh, <laughs> I said, fabulous. So we signed a deal to partner up on our back then. It was so much fun. And, that meant uh, and, and, uh, Gary, you're and, big on that. And just so yeah. people can appreciate how powerful that is, number one, it's an indirect approach. That was not even part of Suzanne's consciousness. Oh, I, know, I know Suzanne. She's completely authentic. So when she said, I, w I went after this man as a mentor, I know that's exactly what was in the frame of her brain. Oh, yeah. But when you do that and it's genuine, um, magic happens because now everybody's comfortable. They're having a conversation about mentoring. Mm -hmm. People are, feel free to react however they like. And she's talking about a gentleman who's a friend of both of ours. Michelle is, um, uh, you know, he's done some, he's got quite a body of work. He's a formidable producer. He's done iRobot and... Suzanne, you're better with remembering credits. Yeah, catch me if you can. You know, catch me if you can. That was another one. He said, like his stuff was over a hundred million. You know, yeah. I wasn't even thinking. He said he wants to read something of mine. I'm saying I don't have anything in that realm, but still. And it was so interesting because at the meeting he said, oh, he said I'm so glad uh, that we had this meeting. And I said, you're glad, you know. And he said, yeah. He said, you know, because I know that you helped start what's called Canadians Abroad. It was an organization that I was one of the founders of. A long time, 18 years ago. And he said, you know, my wife and I would really love to be members, but we need a sponsor, you know, or whatever to get in, or, or we need to know how to get in, you know, would you kind of get us organized? And so I did, so they became, you know, members of Canadians Abroad. And so who knew that there was this little two three three going on that he was happy to be meeting with me. So you just never know. You know, it's always a two way three. And every time you are asking for something, I want to put this in, any time you're asking for anything, always please end the conversation what can I do for you? Because I notice in this industry, I'm noticing right now, because we just were in breakdown services last week, so people who were starting to get out, obviously, that were in pre-production, started pre-production yesterday. What's today, Tuesday? Yeah, yesterday. <laughs> oh, God, oh, my God. So oh. busy. <laughs> anyway, yeah. <laughs> um, and I'm noticing that I'm getting a lot of calls saying, you know, here's what I can do, uh, you know, I'm a composer, I'm a this, I'm a that, I'm a that, here's my resume, here's my resume. And it would be really nice for people to say, you know, well, you know, at this point, you know, when you're kind of busy, you know, in this situation, what can I do for you in the meantime? You know, well, there's, no, there's very so often people coming forward like that, you know. I, well, I have one for you right here, actually. Um, yeah. Thank you. It's from um, Owl and Proctor. Thank you, so, uh, Suzanne, for sharing. If you need a contact in Alberta, Alberta, give me a holler. <laughs> Very helpful there. A couple of great comments here. Time has gone by way too fast. We've been an hour here. Thank you, Suzanne. You're a true gem. Um, absolutely love that. And another one from Jamie saying, Suzanne, thank you for all the great information. So now we've spun through this hour so quickly, we need to arrange to have you back at some point. <laughs> okay. <laughs> thank you. I also want to just show off my little book here, too. Okay, oh, yeah. An indie film producing two years ago for Focal Press, uh, now Francis and Taylor, or Taylor and Francis or whatever. And um, uh, so, if anybody's even thinking about even thinking about uh, about producing your own indie film, please, for the love of God, um, read that book. Suffer. And I've put the link in the comments here, so mm -hmm. you can go grab it while you can. <coughs> okay. That book Here. is like an hour. That book is like having guardrails that will keep you from falling off a cliff. Uh, <laughs> 
and 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 in and you're right, Beth and Suzanne. We, we you know we there's so much that we didn't get to talk about. We can do that in a future a future call. But I love those last points because we talk so often about the importance of having mentors mm -hmm. and how that can open your mind, open doors, open opportunity. <clears throat> so thank you for talking, telling us your experience on on that front as well. Mm -hmm. Um, your uh, people, if you want to know more, you can look at Suzanne's website. She's got a wonderful website that is her name, uh, Suzanne Lyons, L Y O N S dot net, I believe. Yep. yep. Send the comments there. F U Z A N E. Okay. Oh, so you put that in the comments. Thank you, Beth. And, uh, and go ahead. There's a 10 tip series that I did a couple of years ago when my book was coming out. Local Press wanted me to um, uh, do more online uh, stuff. So I did a whole series. There's over 120 YouTube online posts. So youtube.com slash Suzanne Lyons, S U Z A N N E L Y O N S. For Canadians, S U Z A N N E L Y O N S. <laughs> pronounces it differently. And um, so, to, and, and there's things like getting, you know, 10 tips to get a mentor, 10 tips to uh, raise funds for your home, 10 tips to network, 10 tips to pitch your project. So there's a whole ton of 10 tips in there. Fantastic. And, and, and we all hold a very big thought, and everybody go talk socially about it, go buy tickets to it, whatever. The calling is coming out this Friday evening. Uh, with uh, Susan, uh, I mean, I love this cast: Susan Sarandon, uh, Donald Sutherland, Topher Grace, Helen Burstyn. We, we 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 look forward to seeing your film. Congratulations! Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and 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 have a great launch into production for this new one. Thank you. Uh, and for making time for us in the middle of all this. <laughs> Thanks. No, a next break actually. <laughs> now back to <the> that. <laughs> Yeah. Thanks, Gary. It was really fun. Thanks a lot. Thank, fun. thank you, Suzanne. Have a beautiful evening. Thanks so much. Night, everybody.